You may be seated. Well, as per our tradition, let's take a moment to welcome our guests that are tuning in online and who are here physically. Let's welcome them with a big Transformation Church welcome. So for those of you who are curious, you are exploring Jesus. Maybe you've even given up on the idea of church. Maybe you think God has given up on you. We want you to know uh, that this is a safe space to be curious, a safe space to ask questions, a safe space to explore. Uh, My wife and I, when we planted Transformation Church, and many of you said, yes, we believe this is what God is doing, we wanted to create a community that could reach people who were exploring because neither my wife nor I grew up in church. And so the idea of coming into a building and singing songs that we never knew, like the only buildings we went to was the club. Our worship music was Tupac. And so to walk into here and go, what in the world is this? We want you to know that you're welcome. And what you felt that you can't explain was Jesus calling your name. So just take one more step closer, one more step closer. Next, let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our Correctional Facility Partnerships. Now, I typically, I typically don't do this, but I'm going to. Uh, Stephen at Kershaw, I got your letter. So there's a correctional facility that we've been in for years, and a gentleman named Stephen wrote me. And he said that when people find out the crimes he committed, they won't allow him to come to their church. Well, Stephen, we want you to know that in 20 months when you get out, we have a seat right here just for you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. And to the TZ family, it is so good, and it is so good to see our seats continue to fill up and fill up. Usually in October, there's a dip, and it's like we, we rose up. So for those of you at home, man, we love the online opportunity. It is awesome. But get in the house. Get in the house because the presence of God is thick up in this piece, if you know what I'm saying. By the way, for my white brothers and sisters, that means in our congregation. <laughs> Some of the white brothers are like, Pastor, we've been with you 12 years, bro. We know what you're saying, homie. <laughs> All right, before I dive into our message, uh, I have an exciting announcement. As you know, um, there's been horrible, horrible hurricanes in Puerto Rico, and so we want to bless our brothers and sisters that are there. That island has been through so much. Also, um, Florida has been through so much. I can't imagine what it would be like to see your life's investment just gone. And so one of the things we want to do with our generosity that as we give where there's a need, we want to fulfill that need. And so I want you to know, as a result of your generosity, we're going to be partnering with Convoy of Hope and also uh, Water Mission, $10,000 each to each organization. This is just the beginning of seeing how we can financially help. So let's give God a round of applause um, that we want to make an impact. And let me do, just do like a micro mini sermon here. If you're part of Transformation Church, our vision is upward, inward, outward. Love God completely. Love yourself correctly. Love your neighbor compassionately. Our neighbor is 8 point billion people on planet Earth. Just because the problem hasn't knocked on your door, that doesn't mean we shouldn't open it. And our motivation for that is none other than King Jesus. We believe that God is eternal. No one created God. We also believe that God is tripersonal. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. How does that work? When you figure it out, let me know. But the best illustration I can give from Scripture is a triangle. A triangle has three points, but it's one. If you remove one of the angles, it's no longer a triangle. Well, God is one being who reveals himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. So can you imagine in the eternal counsel of God, God who is all-knowing, Father, Son, and Spirit says, man, our creation that we love so much, the human beings are going to make a mess. They're going to introduce sin. They're going to hurt each other. They're going to oppress each other. And Jesus is like, well, that ain't my problem. 
Let them figure it out. No, love says, I'm gonna go into the problem and be the solution to the problem. What if we actually believe scripture and we are our brothers and sisters keepers? What if we took less from the world and gave more? Unbelievers would actually go, yeah, I wanna be a part of a Jesus like that. Well, a Jesus like that is the biblical Jesus. And so we are grateful that we're able to do that. So when you give, understand that it's not paying a tax. It's actually moving the kingdom forward. It's reaching lives. It's, it's helping people. We're continuing our series, Mystery. Mystery is a deeply beautiful Jewish word that the Apostle Paul wrote about in the book of Ephesians. He's writing to multi-ethnic churches in what we know today as modern-day Turkey. And these churches have people from all types of backgrounds and ethnicities, all types of stuff. Some came out of prostitution, came, some came out of tax collecting. I mean, just a mixture of people. And he reminds them of how they can have unities. He goes, you are the mystery of Christ. And the mystery of Christ is God took all types of people. The language that's used in the Bible is Jew and Gentile. Jews and Gentiles did not get along, but in Jesus, he brought them along to become a family. And he says, listen, not only am I going to redeem you, not only am I going to forgive you, not only am I going to give you a new heart, not only am I going to give you a new mind, but I'm doing it so that you can be my hands and feet on planet earth. If you are a Christian from another church, welcome but understand this, God's goal is not for us to escape planet Earth because it's getting bad. Jesus said this, do on Earth as it is in heaven. We're so busy trying to escape Earth, and Jesus is busy trying to bring heaven to Earth through me and you. I did that wrong. Through me <laughs> and you. I was trying to make a point. Had a concussion moment. <laughs> By the way, I may have a flashback. If I tackle you, just go with it. I'm a professional. You won't be hurt. I'll come back on stage. So here's the question. Here's the question for us. Teenagers and preteens, I ask a lot of questions. You know why? Because I want you to know your faith. I want you to own your faith. Teenagers and preteens, we talk to you. You know why? Because you're brilliant. You are smart. You are intelligent. The reason why I know you can understand theology is because you're in AP history, because you're in calculus. If school doesn't dumb down, we're not going to dumb down. God uses teenagers right now. Jesus' disciples most likely were teenagers except for Peter. So we believe in you. So we're going to teach in such a way that you can grab a hold to it because God uses teenagers. So here's a question for us. If Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, how does he build his kingdom on earth? So let's do some theology here. Because human beings are broken the Bible uses sin, it uses sickness, it uses spiritual debt. In other words, we're separated from God, which means we're separated from our purpose. So what does God do? He's a loving father. He sends his son to do what? To live the Ten Commandments perfectly because you and I couldn't. To die our death on the cross. It's called the great exchange. Jesus exchanges his life for our life. Our life is unrighteous. His life is righteous. His life is holy. Our life is unholy. And so Jesus says, Dad, put upon me all their mess and all of my beauty. I'm going to put upon them so they can be restored to you. And then when he's dead for three days, somehow supernaturally through faith in him, we're dead as well. But on the third day when he raises again, we rise to new life. The theologians call that regeneration, that literally the life of Christ pulsates in all of his followers, but the story's not over. 40 days later, he does what's called the ascension. He is extend, extended unto the right hand of the Father, and it says that he is seated. Let me pause. Why is Jesus sitting? Why did he sit down? Because he's like, Dad, I took care of business. I handled it. It's finished. Everything that we need to do to rescue these people, I did it. So I'm going to sit down. Now watch this. What does that mean, right hand of God the Father? Well, God the Father doesn't have a literal right hand. God is spirit. 
That's a Hebraic term for equal honor. It plays into the triune nature of God. It's saying that the Jesus who sat down is eternally God with the Father and Holy Spirit. By the way, if Jesus is not eternally God the Son, him dying for you and me is useless. If Jesus is not 100% man, him dying for us is useless. He has to be the God man. Why? Because with his humanity, he grabs us and comes near. With his second nature of the Trinity, he pulls the Father and the Holy Spirit and he says, now we're one. Now we're together. Now we are restored. But if Jesus is doing all that up there, how does he build his kingdom down here? Romans 8, 34, who is the one who condemns? In other words, if you're a follower of Jesus, the devil cannot condemn us. Why? The charges have been dropped. The case has been dismissed. You and I are forgiven for our past sins, our present sins, and even sins we have not committed. The blood of Jesus is applied past, present, and future. The devil cannot condemn us. People cannot condemn us. Let me hit this really quick because in this generation, let me talk to the 25-year-olds and younger, and let me talk specifically to the teenagers and preteens. If someone is talking about you online and talking trash, guess what? You ready? This is deep now. You don't have to listen to it. Grab your finger, not the middle one, <laughs> but this one and press a button called delete. Press a button called mute. Press a button called block, block, block. <laughs> Growing up in the 70s and 80s, I would come home, granny, they making fun of me about my clothes and they calling me black. White folks, let me let you know a little insight into the black community. The darker you are, the more fun you get made of, not by white people, but by black people. Watch this, this is gonna freak y'all out. I would say, Granny, why are they doing that? And she's like, Dewey, why are you listening to them? You don't have to listen. And then she would say, Baby, never forget this. Black of the berry? How we all know that. <laughs> now, here's some insight into the how the devil works. I'm using humor for a serious point. In slavery days, the lighter skinned you were, you were in the house because Massa was your dad, and that created barriers and conflict. My mom was light-skinned, my aunt has hazel eyes and blonde hair. The black girls would beat them up at school, and then the white girls would call them the N-word. The devil loves to divide by surface things. Jesus loves to unite by the color of his blood. Don't let anybody condemn you. Christ Jesus is the one who died, and even more, I love when Paul goes crazy and he goes, but even more, has been raised, he is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. That means that Jesus is actually praying for you. For what? So your dreams can come true, so my dreams can come true. Let me say this to you and hear my heart, particularly if you're new. Your dreams and my dreams are way too small for what Jesus wants to do in your life. If your dream is simply to get a lot of money, move into Ballantyne or somewhere nice, have a car, a second home, and those types of things, your dreams are way too small. If your life is only about your life getting better, your dream is way too small. God wants to resurrect something in you that's going to blow your everlasting mind, that the job that you think is boring is your divine assignment. The parenting that you want to rush by is your divine assignment. The forgiveness you need to give is your divine assignment. God is going to, I want you to see that I have fitted you for my kingdom and you have a role and you have a place. <laughs> and he gives us the grace to do it. Watch this, family. Teenagers, Jesus builds his kingdom on earth through his body. And his body on earth is you and I. He builds his kingdom through our work. He builds his kingdom through our dating. He builds his kingdom through Everything. The only thing Jesus doesn't build his kingdom in is our sin. So, in the mystery of Christ, who is the body of Christ? Teenagers and preteens, the body of Christ 
is those who give their allegiance to Jesus and are baptized into him. So let me give you some explanation here. The word for faith in the New Testament is a Greek word that is used for those who follow a king. So faith means allegiance or trust. And it's more than just mental ascension. It is, I have allegiance to this person. Um, I, I trust this person the most. And so what happens is, is there comes this moment where your life and the spirit of God collides. And in that moment, he opens our eyes and says, Jesus is better than adultery. Jesus is better than any sin. Jesus is who you were created to give your allegiance to. Now, right now you go, well, Derwin, I don't give my allegiance to anybody. By you saying that means you give your allegiance to yourself. The worst delusion in life is self-delusion. No one has deluded and lied to you and I more than you and I. Jesus is saying, I want to give you my life. I want to change you from the inside out. And it is a pure gift. It is unconditional. It's hard for us humans to understand that because everything is built upon conditions. Now, listen, I know my wife loves me. I love her. But she didn't love me unconditionally. She just didn't see me one day and go, oh, Mr. 18-year-old, I love you. I'm going to spend the next 32 years with you. No, I had to earn that love. I mean, I had to earn it. And let's be honest, parents. When our kids are small and they don't know that they can do opposite of what we say, oh, I love them unconditionally. Oh, I love y'all young parents. You guys are great. You're so cute. You'd be on your little Instagram. Well, let me tell you about parenting. <laughs> I'll be reading it going, how old are they? <laughs> oh, okay. So they ain't hit 12 years old and go, mom and dad can't see everything that I do, and I can do what I want to do. And all of a sudden, you'd be like, what happened to my great parenting? Don't feel bad at all. Think about God's first kids, Adam and Eve. They had the perfect parent, and what did they do? So you know what I've learned as a parent? The greatest thing I can do is point my kids to the perfect father because I'm an imperfect dad and his grace is sufficient. And this is one thing that I know. If God can save Derwin, he can save my kids. He can save your kids. He can save you. If he can do it in you, he can do it in them. So guess what? Go on, get out of your little helicopter and you ain't got a helicopter parent no more. Oh, did y'all catch that? You're like, I don't helicopter parent. <laughs> Allegiance to Jesus and baptized into him. So, so what, does it, what does it mean to be baptized into him? There's a spiritual act. The moment that you say yes to Jesus as Savior and Lord and King, the moment you say yes to him, the spirit of God transfers you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and you are spiritually baptized into him. Then there's the physical act of baptism of going in the water and coming out. Going into the water and coming out of the water doesn't forgive you. It's a sign that you've been forgiven. Going into the water and coming out doesn't mean you have eternal life. It's a sign that you have eternal life. Case in point, if I choose to walk out of the house without my wedding ring, I am still married. But my wedding ring reminds me and it reminds other people that I am married. And so what baptism does is it shows who our allegiance is to. And when we are baptized, God does something utterly amazing. Watch this. But since that faith has come, allegiance has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. This term sons is a beautiful Jewish word that God used to describe his covenantal relationship with the nation of Israel. So men and women were called sons, not because we're genderless, but because it's a term of endearment, intimacy into me, you see. 
Check this out. There is nothing like a mother's love for her son. Now, moms and daughters have love. But if you want to mess with a mama, mess with her son. God is saying, children, you, you, you're, you're my sons. Like, like, like we, we have this special bond because of our faith in Jesus. You mess with my son, you're messing with me. It's a, it's a covenantal love. And then it says, for those of you who are baptized into Christ, so that's spiritual baptism, and it also can mean physical baptism. For those of you who were baptized into Christ, now watch this, have been clothed with Christ. So when we say yes to Jesus, God takes our rags of unholiness, our rags of sin, our rags of unrighteousness, and clothes us with the very righteousness of Jesus. The Apostle Paul is a master teacher. What is he doing? He's using a common understanding for an uncommon reality. In the ancient world, if you wanted, let's say, a yellow shirt, you would go to a tailor, give them yellow cloth, he would make the shirt or she would make the shirt and then dip it all the way into the yellow dye and pull it out. And when it came out, it was no longer the color that went in. It came out a different color. It came out the color yellow. Well, when you and I are dipped into Christ, we come out with a new color, the blood of Jesus, the very righteousness of Jesus. And so when God sees us, he sees Jesus. And when you look in the mirror, what you should see is not yourself getting older, not being a little bit overweight, not comparing yourself to this person. You should see what Jesus sees. You know what the devil fears most about you and I? If we would ever believe that we are who God says that we are because he can no longer tempt us. Let me give you an illustration. So I grew up poor. I shopped at a store called Hand Me Downs. You millennials and Gen Z don't know what hand-me-downs are. Hand-me-down mean your big cousin hand you down some clothes. And y'all thought Michael Jackson was the man when he wrote them high waters shoes. That was just like, I couldn't go shopping. So, you know, joggers that are short now are in vogue. Well, in 1981, they were not. And I got laughed at. <laughs> so... When I got some money, I'm like, you know what, man? I'm going to give me some suits because I watched Eddie Murphy in Trading Places. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to give me some suits like Eddie Murphy. So I had a, a tailor. His name was Daswani, an Indian cat. He would come down from Washington, D.C., and he would go to Indianapolis, and he would give me tailor-made suits. Man, when I got on the plane, I'd be like, you know how, like, the professional players roll up in their suits? Man, I invented that. I would just roll up. <laughs> I would roll up. My favorite suit, man, was this all-white suit. I still got it, but I can't wear it. Because when the tailor made it, I was 202. Brother now sitting at about 272. So if you ever see me wear it, just know it is not buttoned up. Matter of fact, let me show you what it looked like. Ooh, woo, 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 Vicky, we was fine back in the day, girl. Ain't no woman like the one I got. <laughs> Woo, we, we was young and looking good. That's my daughter's face you're wearing. It's amazing. Okay, so we were getting ready for this thing called the La Grande Soiree. It was in Indianapolis during an Indianapolis 500 and celebrities and CEOs and I mean, everybody of everybody was there. So we got a personal invitation. I was like, ooh, I'm gonna wear my white suit up in that piece. Because when I put on that white suit, it made me feel different. And I'm like, I'm not getting in mud. I'm too clean. I ain't about to eat no shrimp with cocktail sauce. I can't get dirty. So I avoided certain things because of the way I was dressed. What if you and I avoided certain things because of the way we are dressed? Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. What if you actually believe that you were clothed in holiness? What if you actually believe you were clothed in truth? What if we actually believe that we were clothed in mercy and grace? What if we believe that we were clothed in none other than King Jesus? What if you saw what he saw? It would change the way we live. 
You and I don't have a behavior problem. We have a belief problem. The scene of the crime is your mind. Teenagers, the body of Christ is those marked by physical baptism. Once again, this wedding ring doesn't make me married. It just shows that I'm married. And so throughout the history of Christianity, one of the things that we do is we say, when I'm baptized, it's going public with I follow Christ. And the idea is that physical act is to be a reminder. One of the things that I like to do is I like to ask people questions about their tattoos. Like when I travel and I meet folks, why? Because one, people love to talk about themselves. Two, sometimes you can see a need in someone's soul by what they've tattooed and what they've said. Sometimes you meet folks who go, man, I, don't need, I was drunk when I got this. Man, I was so high, I don't even know what happened. I woke up and I'm tatted. But then there's some people like, this tattoo means this and why. And it's a reminder. So for me, I'm a little too dark to get tatted. So I wear this bracelet here that says, upward, inward, outward. The Vision of Transformation shirt. So when I look down and I want to cuss someone out in traffic because they cut me off and flicked me off, I look down and I go, okay, love God completely, love yourself correctly, love your neighbors compassionately. It, it, this symbol reminds me of who I am. Well, physical baptism is not so you can just take a picture and put it on the wall. Physical baptism is a reminder of who we're married to, of who we belong to. It's an external reality of the internal work of King Jesus. Check this out. Jesus was baptized. Well, Jesus in his humanity had no sin. Why was he baptized? He was baptized to show allegiance to his Father's will. By the way, listen, if you follow Christ and there's nothing he's demanding in your life that is contrary to your will, I don't think you're following Jesus. If he's not constantly challenging you to grow in his grace, to grow in his mercy, you may be following another Jesus. Because King Jesus will ask us to give up things that are harmful to us and other people. For some of you, King Jesus is saying, hey, dad, all this golfing and gaming, you need to give it up and help your young wife raise this child. By the way, it's not her job to raise the child. You put some chromosomes up in there too, homie. Oh, listen, as a young husband, I would go golfing and then I'd, I'd go like at six in the morning, come back at nine and sleep. And one time Vic was looking at me like, bro, really? Are you serious right now? And I had to make a choice. Like, I didn't say for richer or for poorer sickness and health to golf. I said it to her. And I'm just as much raising that child as she is. So God is going to challenge us. He's going to challenge us politically. He is. Some of you, ooh, Obama, gonna, Obama can't change the world. Oh, Trump, make America. Oh, come on. Politicians, they're doing their best, maybe. But our greatest vote has already been cast. When we said yes to King Jesus, stop asking the government to do what God has called you to do. And let me say this since I'm here. Have you noticed how Jesus treated sinners? Listen, you can't clean a fish until you catch it. So why are we trying to make people who are not Christian act like Christians when we ain't even acting like Christians? Because a Christian understands a leopard cannot change their spots. If you are upset about certain people in a certain lifestyle, why don't you become a friend and love them unconditionally? Jesus got called out. Why? Because he hung out and was friends to sinners. It doesn't say he relied on politicians to do a cultural war. That's the Bible. Just read it. Seriously. 
Turn off the late night cable news propaganda, whatever side to the left or to the right, upside down, whatever, and read the Bible and you will see a Jesus that goes, you want to change the Romans? Build relationships with them. Hey, you want to you change the world? Then pay your employees right. How many other houses you need? How many cars you need? How many more clothes you, you need? Pay a worker a good wage. Wow. <laughs> Jesus was baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water to heaven, suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. So we see the blessed Trinity here, Jesus, Spirit of God, and here comes the Father. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. The early church family was baptized. This is so cool. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Yeah. Okay, it got stuck. I'm going to read it. The first Christians were baptized. That's what it's supposed to say. The first Christians were baptized. So write write that in your notes. First Christians were baptized. There we go. Y'all follow me? Derwin's a little bit off. You're doing great. Verse 41 of verse 2. So those who accepted his message, this is Peter preaching, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. If you don't like big church, you would have had a problem with the early church. 3,000 people. Derwin has a couple questions. First one, who was counting? <laughs> one, two, 800. Oh, I got to start over. Hey, Peter, 3,000. Brush, 3,000. Man, it's a good day. <laughs> Second thing, I pray that one day that their Transformation Church campuses surrounding North and South Carolina and to the nation that one day I would be able to stand up and go, hey, family, because of your preaching and living of the gospel, 3,000 people were baptized today. I pray that that day comes quickly. You know why? Because I can't tell you how many people I've baptized here who are on the verge of suicide. I cannot tell you how many people I baptize here whose marriages have been healed. I can't tell you how many people I baptize here who God has used, and it goes on and on. Every single number is a person. How selfish would it be for me to keep what God has done in me? And same for you. Check this video out, family. Yeah, we can clap about that. So it's communion day, so I got to keep this short. The first person you saw baptized was me baptizing my mom. So my mom is 17 years older than me. We basically grew up together. We've had some ups and we've had some downs. And I prayed for that moment for at least 15 years for Jesus to grab a hold of her heart. And you know what's amazing? As Jesus has grabbed a hold of my heart and as Jesus has grabbed a hold of her heart, our hearts are knitted closer and closer together. So when we talk about people getting baptized, not only is it theological, but it's also deeply, deeply personal. There are people that God wants to unite in your life as they are united to Christ. Here's a question, have you been baptized? On October 28th, we're gonna have an outdoor baptism here at Transformation Church. It's gonna be epic. We're gonna celebrate, like Prince said, like it's 1999. We are gonna celebrate people going public and saying, this is who my allegiance is to. Lastly, teenagers and preteens, young adults, 
Who is the body of Christ? The body of Christ is a baptized family of oneness and unity. Oneness means this, that all of our lives together are united to King Jesus. That somehow, someway, supernaturally, when you say yes to Jesus, you say yes to your brother and sister as well. God loves the people you don't like. Now, I'm not saying about staying in abuse and people taking advantage of that. That's not love. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that what keeps us together in Christ is greater than what tries to divide us. There is money in division and keeping people divided. But we share oneness in Christ, but also unity. Now, what does unity mean? Unity does not mean that we're all the same. Um, Hundreds of years ago, particularly in America, white missionaries would go to Africa, and it wasn't really about only converting them to Christ. It was converting them to become Eurocentric. That's not what unity is. Unity is discovering Jesus and living Jesus out in your unique context. So here's a multi-ethnic church. We want you to bring not only your color, we want you to bring your culture. You know why? Because your differences make me better. My differences make you better. God takes all of that and mixes us together, and together we are greater. Together we achieve more. Derwin Gray doesn't know everything. You don't know everything. But if God mends us together, we can see with multiple eyes. We can serve with multiple hands. We can bring multiple experiences to a world that needs it. And is it easy? Heck no. By the way, when has anything great ever been easy? People are like, man, you miss playing in the NFL? Nope. I was talking to the Arizona Cardinals last night, and I was talking to them, and I was saying, you know, make sure you take care of yourself. I said, guys, look, I'm 51. My back hurt right now preaching to you. They started laughing. I was like, no, that's not a joke. That's like for real. Like there's a cost to it. So to do what I did, there was a cost to it. It's not only do you have to be um, incredibly athletic, but your mind. Like I don't typically play sports with people in the church because once the flip switches, it switches. And I don't want to hurt people and be like, man, I ain't going to that church. That pastor's crazy. <laughs> like, I am, I'm, I'm just, I'm super competitive that way. That's just the way I'm wired. One time on a cruise, is in 1993, and uh, as an NFL player, you get a free cruise. You just got to sign some autographs, do some things. One of them was playing in a basketball tournament, and some guy won the opportunity to play with me. We're playing, and he wasn't playing hard. I told him to sit down. I was like, if we're going to play, we're going to win. I, this poor dude was like, ah, uh-huh. <laughs> Here's my point, though. All of us together have a uniqueness that God brings in for y- unity. Now, we have to agree upon the main things, but the secondary things we don't have to agree upon. But the body of Christ is a family of oneness and unity. Where we get this from? Here's the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians. He says, for just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so is also Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit. Listen, the minute you say yes to Jesus, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You cannot be saved without being baptized into the Holy Spirit. One of the ways you know if you're baptized in the Spirit is you're more loving, you're more kind, you desire to see people come to know Jesus. That's the main ways. You wouldn't know my disciples because they... Okay, 80 of y'all know that scripture. You will know my disciples because they? Good job. Okay, I heard you. You should have sung it. Love. Okay. For we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now watch this. Why does he say whether Jews or Greeks? Because the Jews and Greeks were not getting along. So he goes, listen, guys, being prejudiced towards each other is so dumb. How can you be prejudiced against someone who's clothed in the same Christ you are? He says, where the slaves are free. This is speaking of economics. Upwards to 85% of the Roman world was slaves, not American slavery, but indentured servants. That's a whole different deal. I preached on that in the 
summertime, but in other words, you treat the CEO the same way you treat the garbage man. And we're all given one spirit to drink. So when you look at other followers of Jesus, there's unity and oneness. Um, I want to show you this picture here. This picture right here was drawn by a member of our church. She's on a production team. She plays the violin. Um, And so I had her draw a picture of Jesus. We don't know what Jesus looked like, but from history, we know that a first century Second Temple Jewish man did did not look like he was from Northern England. A first century typical Jewish man was about 5'1", 5'2", brown skin, olive. The Jewish diaspora up into Europe hadn't happened yet for a few centuries. And, and so he would have looked like a man of his time. But what's most important is this, is we are the body of Christ. And so you see all these different pictures of every nation, of every tongue. We somehow supernaturally make up the body of Christ. What if we actually began to see each other? other this way. All right, I'm going to challenge you here. Wives, it would be very hard to speak disrespectfully to your husband in front of his son like he's 12 if you realize that's the mouth of Christ. Husbands, it'll be hard to neglect your wife emotionally when you realize you're clothed in Christ. It'll be hard to sleep with your boyfriend or your girlfriend when, you, when, when you're like, hey, Jesus, let's go fornicate together. Hey, Jesus, let's let's get on the internet and watch porn together because I'm going to use your hands and your feet. I'm going to use your mind, your eyes. What if we actually began to believe that we are the body of Christ? God does this so that we can remember. Y'all remember when Michael Jackson said, remember the time? Well, remember grace. Remember who you are. And Jesus is better. And you and I are the hands of and feet of the king. Let's pray. Lord, before we go into the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded that we are the body of Christ. Baptized into him. All that's true of Jesus is true of us. Forgiven, holy, blameless love. I want to do something in the middle of this prayer. Everybody uh, look up and open your eyes, even those of you online. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. And it's not this question. If you were to die tonight, where would you go? I want to ask you this. When you wake up in the morning, whose glory do you live for? Whose desire do you live for? Because in the South, it's dangerous Just as you go in a garage, that doesn't make you a Mercedes Benz. Just because we walk into a church or have a Bible doesn't make us a Christian. A Christian is someone who has their allegiance to Jesus, that they've realized they have nowhere else to go but to him, and his grace has forgiven them. And they go, Jesus, I want to follow you. It's not about being perfect. It's about allegiance and trusting. It's about receiving God's grace. So my question is, when you wake up in the morning, do you pray, God, fulfill my will, or do you pray, God, your will be done? Do you say there's other options, or Jesus is the only only option. Right here, right now, today, let's settle eternity. Don't leave the sound of this preaching without saying yes to Jesus. Everybody bow your head. Hey, if that's you, when you wake up in the morning, it's not, Jesus, your will be done, and you acknowledge that, and you're ready to follow him. You're ready to just, Jesus, I'm going to give you my life because you gave your life to me. I don't understand everything, but I understand this. Forgiveness and love, I want it. I want a new life. I want a new power, a new heart. If that's you right here, right now, say this to him in the silence of your heart. King Jesus, I bow my knee to you. And I want to thank you for the blood that is applied. I believe that on that cross it should have been me. But you took my place. You set me free from the power of sin and the power of death. Oh, your grace and blood forgives me. And when you were dead in the grave for three days, so was I. But on the third day when you rose again, I rose to new life with you. And when you ascended to be at the right hand of your Father, the Spirit descended to live in me to make me a part of the body of Christ. 
I receive this free gift in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give the Lord a round of applause? In a moment, our campus hosts are going to give you instructions to fill out a connection card to let us know that you prayed that prayer. That's so important because we want to get you baptized. October 28th would be awesome, but we want to know. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to join a 2,000-year-old tradition. You may know it as Eucharist. That's a Latin word for Thanksgiving. You may know it as communion. You may know it as the Lord's Supper. But let me give you the background. Jesus had had two Passover meals with his disciples. This was his third one. Passover is when the Jews celebrated being set free from slavery in Egypt through the blood. And everything's going normal until Jesus breaks the bread. He says, this is my body broken for you. He takes wine and he pours it out and says, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. What Jesus is saying is this. I am the new and better Passover lamb I am the new and better day of atonement. I am the new and better high priest. In me is not only forgiveness, but life. So when we receive the elements, there is a supernatural something that happens. God's presence and God's power. We stand in a long tradition with brothers and sisters all around the world, past, present, and future. So to open up the elements, the top layer is a little tricky. So grab that top layer first, and I want you to roll it back. And then the wafer, the bread's going to come out, and we will receive it together. But let me say a couple things. Now listen, everybody listen, this is so important, family, listen, listen. When Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, how much are you worth to God that he would be broken for you? Now listen, <laughs> your job one day is eventually gonna fire you. They're gonna get younger and cheaper. NFL stood for not for long. Seriously, if you determine your worth by your production, you're never going to produce enough. There's not enough degrees you can get. There's not enough accomplishments you can have that is going to outweigh the living God of the universe being broken for you. Young ladies, you don't have to look like an airbrushed magazine cover to be beautiful or a doctored Instagram filter to be beautiful. God has already declared you beautiful. You know how I know? Because he became a beautiful mess for you. If you're dependent upon your looks to be beautiful, guess what? We all get old. Now, we know black don't crack. It's gonna take a little bit longer for black people, but you get the point. <laughs> but think about it. King Jesus was broken for you. And it wasn't because you did something awesome. It wasn't because you were sinless. No, it was the opposite. We're not awesome and we're sinful, but he's awesome and he takes away our sin. So family, rejoice in receiving the bread and body of King Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you so, so much. Next, we're going to get the juice, so be a little gentle there. We're going to pull it back. Let me do some explaining here. So next, Jesus took wine, and he said, this is my body, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is also the pathway and entrance into his kingdom. If you're a follower of Jesus, we should be the most guiltless people on earth. Our consciousness should be clean. You know why? Because when Jesus forgives, it's forgotten. 
when Jesus forgives, our sins are thrown into the sea of God's forgotten memory. When the Bible says our sins are forgiven and he loves us as far as the east is from the west, as far as the east and from the west, it means it never catches up. It's eternal forgiveness. God doesn't go, ooh, I forgive you. Now what you gonna do next so I can get you? Revelation 13 says the, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. When we realize the depth of his forgiveness, it produces a greater depth of holiness. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. Would you stop condemning yourself about the first divorce? Would you stop condemning yourself about your past? You are free. You are forgiven. You are loved. You have taken a bloodbath. And where there is the blood of God in Christ, there's a new person. So family, let us drink deeply from the blood of our Savior. Father, we praise you and we worship you. We thank you because you're great. We thank you that we are the body of Christ. And in a moment as we pray, we are gonna stand up and we are gonna cheer and we're gonna be grateful. We're gonna have a celebration. We're not gonna be fearful of the future. We're not gonna regret the past. In this moment, we're gonna say thank you, Jesus. Everybody, up to your feet. Let's give him a round of applause. Let's let him know we appreciate his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and his kindness. We will believe that we are who he says we are. We are the body of Christ. We are the righteousness of Christ. We are forgiven in Christ. We are God's forever friends. Amen and amen.